Hello and welcome to BST Live, the show for systematic and algorithmic traders. Glad you could join us today where we're going to be talking about predicting profitability with Ernie Chan. So let's get to it. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Glad you could join us today. I'm really excited for this uh, episode. We've got joining us today is Ernie Chan. Welcome, Ernie. Glad you could join us today. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for inviting me. Now, um, what I, uh, I just realized this morning as I was getting prepared is that um, you've obviously been on the show before, but I didn't realize how long ago it was. I looked it up and it was in June 2015 was the last time you came on the show, which is what, six years ago now. So um, how time flies. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's great to have you here again. On the last um, the last time we talked, we talked about quant trading models, and you know today we're going to be talking about predicting profitability, which sounds like an awesome topic. But before we get into it, uh, can you give us uh, just a quick little bit of background on yourself, just for people who who are maybe new to the show? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yes, I uh, started my um, career actually as a, uh, I mean, out, completely outside of finance. I was a machine learning researcher at IBM Watson Lab. Um, but uh, a lot of my colleagues in that uh, particular group um, became uh, hedge fund managers. Uh, actually, when I was uh, in, in the last year of, uh, of my, uh, my work there, uh, a whole group of, uh, of my colleagues went to become portfolio managers at uh, Renaissance Technology. So I thought that, you know, finance might be an interesting area because you know, all my coworkers seem to be going there. So that's how I, uh, you know, started uh, my career in finance as well at Morgan Stanley. And, yep. um, you know, so I worked for a number of different uh, investment banks and hedge funds in New York and, and Toronto. Um, but, um, you know, around 15 years or so ago, I decided to trade for myself and I, Later on, started my current uh, fund called QTS Capital, uh, which I've been running for uh, about 10 years. Um, but during that time, I rediscovered the merits of uh, machine learning as applied <laughs> to finance. And so uh, we decided to spin out a fintech company called PredictNow.ai that helps other traders utilize uh, machine learning to improve their strategies as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, what we're going to be talking about today, which is a nice segue. Uh, we're going to be talking about predicting uh, profitability using machine learning. Um, now, I want to start with, a, I guess it, it might sound like a simple question on the surface, but uh, I think, um, you know, what we're going to talk about today really shows that it's a, it's a, there's a deeper level to this question. So I want to pose it to you. Uh, what is the probability of profit of your next trade? Why does this sound like a simple question, but it's not like there's more to it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people, when they say, okay, so um, what's the chance that your, uh, your next trade will be profitable? They think of, um, you know, the winning ratio or, or, or profit factor or something like that. But those numbers are a average, right? Mm. So, so, you know, let's say your strategy, uh, you backtested your strategy over 10 years and uh, 55% of the trades uh, are uh, profitable, you say, oh, you know, that's an easy answer. Uh, you know, it's 55%. That would be the probability of profit. But that's what we call a uh, unconditional probability. It doesn't take into account a particular circumstance uh, of the next trade. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it doesn't really help you, you know, as a trader to decide whether to make the next trade because it's, you know, every day is going to be the same, you know, this unconditional probability. What traders really want to know is, given the certain circumstances, current regime, the current market condition, what is really the probability that I'm going to lose money in the next trade or, you know, or make money in the next trade? That's a, what we call a conditional probability, and that's much more useful to a trader. Mm, yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you kind of just alluded to some of the conditions there. That that, um, that go into this conditional probability, but can you give us a few more examples just so that we've got this uh, this concept down? Mm -hmm, sure. So, um, you know, for example, uh, you, if you are trading a um, a short volatility strategies, let's say you know a very common uh, strategy would be 
uh, to short options, uh, short, uh, uh, for example, the fixed futures to mm. harvest the, um, uh, the premium decay of options, right? So those kinds of strategies are typically, you know, very profitable, profitable when the market is calm and it could endanger your, your whole net worth when the market suddenly enter into a crisis, mm. uh, such as what we uh, suffered in the, you know, March 2020. So a conditional probability would look at the current market. Is the market calm? Um, you know, maybe it's conditioned on the probability, uh, on, on volatility, on implied volatility, or on various commodity prices and so forth to determine, uh, to make a best guess as to, you know, tomorrow, you know, is it still going to be such a calm market? And, it's, and if that's the case, then most likely your conditional probability of profit will be high for this shortfall strategy. Right. So you can already see that um, they are, you know, for, you know, from a um, sort of human trader, intuitive point of view, there are a couple of variables that are good candidates for this condition. You know, implied volatility, the volatility, or uh, whether the market had a good return in the last few days and so forth. Um, but as a human, you can only look at a small number of these variables, you know, intuitive though they may be. Mm -hmm. And also, even if you uh, can, you know, narrow down to a few variables, it is hard to, you know, exactly pin down a probability, right? You intuitively, you know that a high volatility market will give you a lower probability of profit for your strategy. But how low, right? That you, how do you build a probabilistic model to capture that? And that's where machine learning comes in. So machine learning not only can take into account hundreds, if not thousands of inputs that you care to um, enter, mm. but it can also build a probabilistic model that give you an actual number. Is it 55% perhaps, or 56% of probability of profit to guide you quantitatively, not just qualitatively, but quantitatively, whether you should trade a strategy or how much capital you should put on a particular strategy. Right. Okay. So, um, before we dig into that uh, deeper, so say so you've uh, you've identified some market conditions where the probability is higher, and maybe some that are lower. Uh, are you just using that to to decide whether you will take the trade or not, or you know how do you how are you overlaying that into your trading decisions? Yes. You know, one uh, simple application would be indeed you say, uh, well, you know, whenever the probability drop below fifty percent. You know, probably a profit drop below 50%, we don't trade that strategy mm -hmm. uh, for tomorrow, for the next trade. That's certainly a possible application. But another way to do it is to um, adjust your capital, adjust the leverage of the strategy. So if you have um, a um, very high probability of profit, you might run, you know, run it with maximum leverage. If the probability of profit is borderline, you might decrease the leverage to a much safer, lower level. And um, that, that is the way where you can, uh, this, this system can be used for capital allocation for uh, optimal leverage determination, uh, in addition to just an on and off switch. Yeah, yeah. So what about then, um, like how much variation are you looking for? Say, for example, you've got a strategy that, I don't know, has a 50% uh, win rate uh, generally across the, the whole series of trades, are you looking for 51%, 52 55 Like how do you decide how much variation you need to, to um, make decisions? Mm -hmm. Well, that calibration process is, um, you know, actually part of backtesting. So it, right. it differs for every strategy. Um, it's, uh, you know, unfortunately no hard and fast rule that says, okay, you know, <laughs> if you are at... Uh, Greater than 55% profitable, profitable, you should you know, run it at full maximum leverage. Uh, this is not that simple. Uh, you know, every strategy has this um, uh, calibration curve in some sense. And right. you, but it's not difficult to, to um, optimize it based, based on back tests. You, you will find that you know, at what, let's say, you have, uh, at what threshold you should run it at maximum leverage uh, will give you the best, let's say, sharp ratio in, in your training data. That's one good way to calibrate uh, right. your trading system based on these probabilities. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, just a little bit earlier, you mentioned that um, 
you know, as humans, we can only look at, um, you know, a, a couple of conditions. We've only got the capacity to look at limited numbers compared to machine learning. I think you said there's thousands. Um, how do you go about deciding what are you actually going to test? Do you, do you actually test thousands or do you use some kind of logic or, you know, what's a process to decide, um, you know, what conditions are you going to test? Now, that's a great question because a lot of, um, if I may say, newcomers to uh, machine learning in finance uh, uh, carry a certain uh, caution with them. And that is, um, you know, traditional finance want to make sure that whatever input variables you use are um, really uh, significant, you know, mm. statistically significant, and uh, they are not uh, redundant. And, they are, and the model is parsimonious. That's the traditional way people construct financial predictive model. Um, and interestingly, in machine learning, one take the opposite attitude. You should throw in as many input variables as possible, no matter whether it is really significant or not, no matter whether it is, makes sense or not. You can throw in, if you like, astrological uh, cycles. You can throw in the moon cycle. You can throw in the, the weather, uh, you know, over New York City, over Chicago, you know, whatever you feel might have some predictive power. And, um, and in fact, you can throw in redundant variables. So some people might say, oh, you know, I think that volatility is a good predictor of my profitability. Should I throw in, however, five-day look back volatility or 10-day or a month? And my mm -hmm. advice is always, all of them. You know, if you, if you can imagine different time frame of volatility, throw in all of them. Because in machine learning, there is a well-developed process called feature selection and features importance ranking uh, that will allow you to filter out unimportant variables. So oftentimes you uh, might be uh, throwing in a thousand variables. Uh, what after this filtering, after this feature selection algorithm, and there are many of them, uh, I can you know, certainly go into some of them, but um, they are well established in the field. And after that sort of selection process, you might be down to a hundred variables mm. that are really important. And not only uh, you know, does this algorithm rank your know, variables, you know, which, is, which is good to get rid of the useless uh, noisy variable and redundant variable, but also it will provide you with great intuition because a lot of people think machine learning is a black box, yeah. but feature importance ranking makes it transparent because it can clearly identify what cluster of variables are important that affect your strategy profitability. Would it be, for example, fundamental variables? You know, let's say you're a stock trader. Uh, would it be uh, the stock's uh, quarterly financial filing that are you know, really affecting uh, your portfolio's returns? Or is it purely technical, like volatility, implied volatility? Mm. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, that kind of intuition, uh, A, will let you have more confidence in this prediction. Because if you don't have confidence in a machine learning model, you would not follow its advice, and then it will be useless. Right? You mm. say, why is the machine learning model saying today my uh, profit is 49%. I don't believe it. It must be wrong. And then you don't follow advice and boom, you get a big loss and you, you just, you know, wasted your time and you, 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 you're frustrated because you yeah. didn't follow the advice. You, you don't have a confidence. So this kind of fair, variable, you know, future importance ranking is important to build confidence in your model because if you can see that, hey, it is looking at the same cluster of variables that you would have looked at you know, volatility or returns or fundamentals, and you will see that they are making sense. You will have more confidence in the model. So that's one mm -hmm. thing. And then the other thing is that, it, you know, the other um, uh, benefit of having this feature selection and, and ranking is that um, it will suggest new variables. So, for example, if it suggests that fundamental variables are actually quite important, in determining your strategy probability, you might go back and look for more fundamental variables. Maybe you started with just 20 fundamental variables and you know, many of them rank high in importance. Yeah. It might motivate you to dig deeper into the so-called factor zoo 
to find out more fundamental factors that people have uh, uh, has discovered about uh, you know the, the companies. Uh, uh, R&D spending and whatnot, and, and add those variables. So it's an iterative process. And because it's transparent, uh, it will hopefully improve your fundamental trader. Even if you are a fundamental trader, you're not a quant trader, this process hopefully is actually going to improve your fundamental stock picking ability. Mm, okay. And that's, that's the benefit of, of, of this scheme. Yeah, yeah. Got an interesting question here from BK Capital. I'll just put it up on the screen here. Um, Weren't too many variables or features, I guess. Just confuse the module. Oh, sorry, the model. <laughs> the edges are slim already. Right. So as I said, there are well-established techniques. The, the, the notion of features, importance ranking, and feature selection are well-established uh, machine learning techniques that will filter out variables that are actually not important. And, and typically, the way they filter it out um, is using cost validation. So we'll actually try these variables on an out of sample set to see right. if they still have predictive power. If they are not, they don't have predictive power, uh, they will be ranked low and you can fold them up. So you can start with thousands of variables, but as I said, it's, it's, not, it's not likely to confuse the model because after the feature selection, the number of variables that remain will be much smaller and we will only use this remaining set of variables to rebuild a machine learning predictive model. Mm, okay. So does that then mean that you need to retrain the models over time, like every year or something like that? Yes, uh, but mm. that's a little bit separate uh, issue. So right. um, even if you are using the exact same training set uh, and test set, um, the, you always have to train the model twice because the first time you train the model is for feature selection. You're training the model with um, a thousand right, of the original variables, mm -hmm. and you will apply feature selection uh, on all these uh, thousand variables on the what so-called cost validation set. Uh, and if they become useless on this cost validation set, which is essentially a, a out of sample test set, uh, mm -hmm. you, will, you will rank them low and you will fold them out. So that's in, in, in every machine learning process, that involves feature selection, you will already train the model twice. Um, now, um, what, you know, once it goes live, so for example, you, you're you know, confident that your model works out of sample and you go live in the, in the production, uh, typically we will still continue to train the model because it all, it is always the case that more data, the better, uh, provided the new data has the same sort of um, regime as the old data. Uh, and uh, it is always good to retrain a model with more data. So yes, we do uh, do this periodic retraining. Yeah, yeah. And what about actually monitoring um, the the features? So, for example, you do um, your back testing, and you discover that uh, the strategy works great in high volatility. So you go, okay, I understand that. I've got that intuition that you're talking about. What if it for some reason it stops working in high volatility? How do you how do you catch that before it does too much damage to your account? If you're if you're not in a retraining period, like what kind of um, what's the word I'm I'm looking for? Monitoring or assessments do you do to make sure that those those features are still working for your strategy? Yeah, so um, you know this this is a, um, a problem that plagued all finance, of course. So mm. uh, you know, oftentimes we um, uh, train a model, whether it's a machine learning model or any uh, traditional quantitative training model, and it doesn't work because uh, you might say the regime changed. So uh, uh, you know, what, what a, a very recent example is, um, you know, in the second half of 2020, all these gold stock, high tech stocks are booming uh, and uh, valuation goes sky high and then suddenly uh, this year uh, let's say uh, you know starting with the second uh, quarter mm. we have uh, the economy opening again and so a lot of the traditional boring stocks like retail stocks or airline stocks start to uh, you know come back whereas the high-tech stocks are out of favor so there are all these so-called sector rotation that oftentimes occur and certain models Traditional quantitative model, let's say, you know that um, uh, that are great 
for trading momentum and, and high-tech growth stocks are terrible when they are asked to trade, uh, you know, suddenly uh, when the value stocks are obtained because they are looking at um, different variables, right? So, you know, a growth stock model might be just looking at earnings, maybe not earnings growth, just revenue growth or looking at R&D expenditure, whereas a value stock model look at, you know, book to price ratio, you know, dividend, that kind of boring stuff. And who knows when the market will look at which variable. Right? So that's, um, you know, generally speaking, if you are a traditional uh, quant stock picker, that's, that's a problem. You know, when, when, the, when should I use which model? But the, mm. uh, the idea about machine learning is that, well, there are variables that you should look at that should automatically select which variables you're looking at. So um, if you have enough variables, this is an automated process. Uh, of selecting what model or what variable you should look at. There's a hierarchy of right. variables. So, for example, um, you might see that, uh, you know, in a uh, situation where uh, volatility is low, uh, people are going to go back to, you know, using the value stock model. So, volatility itself is a variable that will select between the two models. So, in other words, yeah. in the machine learning model, um, not just in finance, but in, um, you know, in the general AI community, the idea is that you should incorporate as many variables as possible because the more variables you have, the better they are at selecting themselves, you know, as to what regime it is. The better they are in determining the regime. And of course, uh, not only more variables, but you need more data because, you know, obviously if, the, if, you, if you, um, you know, train a model that has never seen a um, crisis, it mm. would never ask you to trade a model that, you know, let's say a crisis alpha strategy. Yeah. Uh, so you need a, not only have a lot of variables that capture different regimes, but you need a long enough period where it can, it has seen different regimes. Therefore it is able to adjust what pick the correct variables to use uh, in the appropriate regime. Mm. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, you, you might call it a very general, a model will be able to do that now. Uh, right. That is, of course, the theory. In practice, uh, it's not easy to pick enough variables and have enough data. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. You haven't found the crystal ball yet, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would, you wouldn't tell people. I'm sure. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. Well, you know, the, the crystal ball is uh, is like um, you know, it, it, it's really for each person that there, there, there's their own crystal ball because yeah, the idea is that we don't. Um, actually advise people to use machine learning to develop the base trading strategy because it's um, very easy to overfit. We ask them to use this for risk management and capital allocation. So mm. in other words, everybody will have their own crystal ball and, you know, I can give you my crystal ball, it won't do you any good because I'm not trading your strategy. So that's uh, one way where machine learning can be, you know, that, that we can discuss it in the open instead mm -hmm. of saying, that, well, this is all very um, secretive. You know, I can, yeah. it's all proprietary, you know, which, is, which is traditionally how uh, quant finance operate. Everything yeah. is a secret. But when you're talking about applying machine learning finance, everything can be very transparent because what I'm trading is very different from what you're trading. And mm -hmm. my machine learning techniques might be useful to me, but, and, and it will also be useful to you, but, we can both be successful and not taking money from each other because, hey, you might be using it to trade gold while I'm trading stocks. Mm. You know, you are not taking yep. profit away from me in any way. Yeah. 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 So in your research, have you discovered that there are maybe uh, particular trading styles or markets or any other characteristics of trading strategies where these techniques work better than others? Is there a sweet spot? Um, no, I don't think that um, uh, there's a particular market where machine learning would be particularly useful because, mm. um, you know, we use it, as I said, as a risk management system. So, you know, oftentimes the input are just returns. We don't know whether the returns are coming from what particular market. Now, it is true that the, um, the features or the input variables that we, we use are highly dependent on what as a task when it's trading, right? So if you are trading forex, you might be using you know many more macroeconomic variables than uh, stock fundamentals. 
uh, yeah. which stands to reason. You know, what does the Tesla's uh, fundamentals have to do with trading Euro USD, right? So in that sense, the features are important um, for, mm. uh, you know, to target particular asset class. But actually, even that, at some point, we will be able to generalize because, as I said, the, the, the process of feature selection will automatically eliminate stock fundamentals if they find out that you are trading a Forex model. It will not mm. be useful. It will automatically eliminate it. So what we are working on uh, is a so-called a universal feature set that may consist of a thousand, two thousand variables, most of which will be completely irrelevant to your trading strategy, but we're going to give it to you anyway, because what's the harm? Feature selection will get rid of them. So, so that, uh, you know, not, so in other words, people don't have to all create their own feature set, which is the most time consuming process. But everybody can essentially use the same data set that everyone uses, a universal data set, universal input. It's easier to narrow it down and to build it up. So you start with the biggest set possible and then apply feature selection. It will narrow it down to the particular asset class that you're trading. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, what about the complexity of a strategy? Because I, I, I imagine there's kind of a, a line you can draw where uh, you've got a like maybe like a very simple strategy and you use the machine learning uh, to do a lot of the driving of, of the position sizing, the risk management, stuff like that. Or you could have a, a more complicated strategy that has perhaps some of this regime logic built into it. And then, you know, the machine learning has maybe less of an impact. So how do you decide, like, what's, what's your preference when looking at, at those two aspects of trading? Yeah, yeah, that's also a, a, you know very interesting. It leads to some interesting thoughts actually, because um, you know when you have learned so much from the machine learning model that you know learn so much intuition or information from the machine learning model that you can incorporate the insights into the original quantitative trading model. Right. You will not need machine learning more anymore, and that is a good thing. Mm. Right? So, if if eventually, if the machine learning model teach you enough that um, you know you you can you don't you you have incorporated all these rules or variables into the original model, uh, that is the point where machine learning won't be able to improve it anymore, and and and, right. and that is a good thing because that that uh, very similar to um, you know this. Uh, AI system called AlphaGo, right? So AlphaGo is a system for playing Go, and they won uh, over all the Go master in the world. It, 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 it beats everybody. Hmm. There's no human that can play Go better than that, that uh, deep learning reinforcement learning system. But what's interesting, and that's well known, you know, Google makes sure that everybody knows about it. But, hmm. um, but what's less well known is that the human grandmaster who play against the AlphaGo for a few months, find their own technique to much to improve greatly as well. They become much better yeah. at playing code themselves when they play against the algorithm. Code. And that analogy can be applied to trading as well. So initially, you will find that, wow, the machine learning system is um, telling me things that I didn't know before. Uh, and you go ahead and incorporate the insights and the improvement into your base trading strategy. And then after a while, you are your trading model becomes so much more improved that it is now perhaps better than the machine learning model. You do not need the mm. machine learning model anymore. Yes. Okay, that, that's interesting. So we've got a lot of questions in the chat, which I want to get to in a sec. But um, So I just want to ask you, um, how effective is this technique? Like, Can you, can you give us a, um, an idea of like the, the difference in returns or in risk-adjusted returns or something? Like, Is it making a big difference or a little difference or...? Yes. So we um, implemented such a system, you know, for our own trading strategy in our fund since the end of uh, 2019. Um, And um, there are both quantitative results and qualitative results. So let me start with the quantitative results. The quantitative result is that um, we, um, our our trading strategy uh, had a, um, I think, 30% return last year. if we didn't have the machine learning risk management system, that would be just 20%. So mm-hmm. it's a 
is a 10% difference. So essentially, the, uh, the improvement of the machine learning system is, uh, is added 10% to our annual return. So that's yeah. quantitative. Now, the qualitative result is, is actually more interesting. What it, we find is that the machine learning system told us, and uh, now, just to um, backtrack a little bit, this strategy that we trade is a crisis solver strategy. It's supposed to make money only when there's a crisis. And the machine learning system tells us not to trade a strategy from uh, November 2019 to January 2020 because it detected no terrorists. They say, if there's no terrorists, why bother to trade the crisis solver strategy? And so we did it. And we were glad that we didn't because those three months were the, one of the very calm, beautiful times in, in, <laughs> in long only investment, essentially. The economy was great. Uh, the, uh, the trade war had subsided. Um, you know, the, no inflation in sight. You know, everybody was just, you know, the best thing you can do is to invest in the spy ETF and, and wake up late every day and try not to get <laughs> close to your trading system because yeah. whatever you do is going to be worse than investing in the spy. So um, suddenly on February 1st, 2020, the machine learning system tells us tail reach is on the horizon, maximize ma- leverage on the crisis solver strategy. And we were shocked. Mm. We were shocked because at that time, people think this pesky little virus is no big deal. It's like a flu, right? I mean, many politicians tell us that it's just a common flu. It's nothing big deal. Mm. But the machine learning system, which surveyed the global environment, actually, not just the US environment, even though we only trade this E-mini index future, detected that is something is happening around the world that is not what the politicians say and decided that there's tail, ha- a tail risk in the horizon and tell us to maximize the leverage of this crisis of strategy. So, and naturally, we followed the advice. And in the next two months, uh, that, that strategy generated over 80% growth return because of that. And mm-hmm. so we were happy. But conversely, around November, if, if you recall, November, a few weeks after the US presidential, we, we like, or maybe a few days after the election, Pfizer announced its vaccine. And our system tell us just a few days before the announcement that we better stop trading a crisis of our strategy because momentum is going to be worse. And we stopped and Pfizer announced, and that was the biggest crash in the momentum factor in history. <laughs> if you recall, at the morning of the announcement, the S&P was up, I don't know, 5 6%. And it's like great stuff. And then the momentum keep crashing throughout the day until at the end of the day, I don't know what it, it ended up, maybe 1.5%. So m- numerous momentum strategies suffered great losses, but that day we didn't trade because the uh, machine learning told us a few days ahead of time that we should stop trading. And that was quite remarkable because how could it possibly anticipate a vaccine announcement? Well, it was only looking at global financial and economic variables. And for some reason, it picked up clues. Maybe, maybe we don't know that the vaccine is going to be announced, but somebody out there know. And that kind of people are trading, affecting the market, mm-hmm. where our machine learning pick up the signal and tell us that momentum crash is coming. Let's stop trading this strategy. And so that saves us. You know, another five percent. You know, if we were to to, to trade that day, probably five to six percent loss uh, on, mm-hmm. on, on on that day. Yeah. So that's the anecdotal um, evidence of of the uh, benefit of uh, applying machine learning for risk management. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a, a question here in the chat from Ola. I'll just put this up. It's a kind of an extension to what you were just saying there. Uh, when you were explaining that, uh, you, you kind of had an idea why the machine learning was saying do this and do that. What about um, this example from Ola is if you find a feature that does have a positive effect, but you don't see a reason why, or you can't understand why, how do you manage that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the um, the feature selection process, um, the the, the kind of feature selection that we use is called cluster-based feature selection. It's uh, called CMDA. So it doesn't consider really individual factors it consider cluster of features. So mm-hmm. if, your, if your feature are in a cluster that is considered important, uh, you can learn 
uh, about it, you can gain intuition from the cluster itself uh, as to you know why why are these in, in this cluster. It, it means that that feature has a lot of correlation, for example, with other features in that cluster. So maybe by itself, it doesn't make any sense. This cluster, you know, you, I mean, this feature, you don't understand it. But if you look at all these other features in the same cluster, you will provide much better intuition. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you have a feature that is unfamiliar and it is put in a cluster, it means that this feature, unbeknownst to you, has a lot of correlation with other features in this cluster that you can understand better. So mm. through this process of clustering, uh, you will not find so many cases where this is a kind of an odd duck standing out and you don't know what to do with it. <laughs> there are no odd ducks because they are all in the clusters with right. a lot of peers that you can identify. Yeah, yeah. We've got a further question actually on this MDA cluster analysis. Let me put it up on the screen. It's from Al. Thanks for the question, Al. Um, Ernie, your, your papers men mentioned MDA clustering analysis before building your prediction models. What's the minimum number of samples for N features to see a stable solution? Well, um, yeah, many people ask that question, uh, but it is a um, there's no uh, specific number. What happened is that um, um, it depends on the statistical significance of, on the features. If your features, like for example, we apply the same technique on a non-financial data set. It's called the, it's a famous data set called the Wisconsin uh, Breast Cancer data set. It's a standard test set for machine learning algorithm. And in that data set, there are maybe 35 to 40 features only, you know, not like the thousand that I refer to. And there are only 500 to 550 samples, very small number of samples compared to finance actually. And yet what we can achieve, our system can achieve 98% accuracy in predicting whether a tumor is benign or malignant. And you say, wow, you guys genius, what so amazing. Well, it's not that we are genius. It's because this feature set that was prepared was prepared by oncologists. So these oncologists know that these features are pretty important anyway. Right, yeah. So they curated this set of features and they are very statistically significant. So just 550 sample is enough for the machine learning system to pick up that strong signal. In finance, on the other hand, no one, or maybe random some technology, a few guys in there or a few guys in two sigma or no, but most of us have no clue ex you know, exactly what variable are important for predicting tomorrow's return. So mm -hmm. we have to throw in everything, including the kitchen sink, a thousand variables. And for that kind of weak signal, very weak, low uh, signal to noise ratio situation, you need more sample. And I would say that 500 will not be enough. Uh, you mm -hmm. will probably need at least uh, thousands, 2,000 uh, data points for it to learn properly. Now, uh, again, I'm not saying that whenever you are in finance, you have weak signal. Some people, their trading strategy are very good. You know, I have seen live trading. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to invest in a trader where they, they practically never have a down one. The, the, the signal to noise is so strong, right, the, the, this, this, this gentleman. And, um, you know, if you apply a, a machine learning system to his trade, you know, you will probably pick up very strong signal and you, don't, you only need like two years of data uh, mm -hmm. to, to predict when he would have the bad luck of losing money. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you know, that, that's not often, uh, you know, that's not often the case in, in finance, um, but it can happen. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for explaining that, Ernie. We've got a question here from Google user, 2004, uh, regular. Um, Ernie, what output, various, output variables should we be looking for from a machine learning model when we throw in thousands of variables? Um, okay, so let me understand, you know, I think what you are asking uh, is uh, what kind of input variables instead of output variables you're looking for, right? So input variable would span everything from technical indicators to global economic indicators to stock fundamentals if you're trading stock. Um, as I said, if you, if you compute um, realized volatility as a variable, don't be afraid to use multiple time frame. 
Uh, so it's a thousand sound a lot, but actually it isn't because every variable you can get five different versions of it. Right? They are not completely distinct. So that's um, the kind of input variables. Whereas for output, um, in this particular application that I advocate, which is risk management and capital allocation, the output variable that they, that your system want to predict is essentially the sign of return. You are trying to predict whether your trade will be profitable or not. So it's a binary prediction, what we call classification problem. Mm, okay. Uh, thanks, Ernie. I've got a question here. It's a two-part question. I'll just put the first part and then I'll read the second part. Uh, this one is from Horo. Welcome, Horo. Uh, there are a large number of machine learning algorithms for various domains. What is the best algorithm or approach to take for time series financial markets? And the second part is um, one I recently learned about is called deep belief as it's less susceptible to overfitting. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, uh, you know, it, it, it is a very controversial topic <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, there are uh, lots of papers published in academia and also in some competition that uh, use uh, very uh, uh, complicated deep learning models. Um, you know, um, long shot um, uh, LSTM and so forth, uh, uh, or CNN or whatnot uh, to to uh, compute uh, to, to make prediction, and others, uh, you know, use very simple you know, logistic regression to come to to make prediction. Uh, we use we uh, typically uh, the in between sort of complexity. We use random forest or boosted decision tree uh, for our uh, our predictions. I have tried uh, simple models and I have tried more complicated models such as uh, neural network or even RSTM. Um, with the data that I had, um, you know, deep learning models seem to uh, have too many hyperparameters to fit. Whenever you hear the word deep, that means that there are many layers and each layer have their hyperparameters. And you, you can imagine a system where you have just 1,000 samples, right? Like in finance, oftentimes you have, um, oh, I don't know, uh, 10 years of uh, daily data. So uh, maybe uh, 2,000 rows of data. But the number of variables in a typical deep learning network is 20,000, 30,000, right? And, um, uh, you know, one of the most recent deep learning uh, uh, network uh, called GPT-3 that is developed by uh, Open AI, uh, I, I, we purely have 300 billion or some number of uh, hyperparameters. <laughs> but imagine using that, you know, fitting that model to your particular time series. You, you essentially, I, I don't see how it is possible that you don't overfit uh, this data set. Unless, unless this model was trained on many other data. Now, it is possible, um, you know, certain Bayesian a model uh, have a prior model that is not trained on your specific data, but trained on many other data, high frequency, low frequency, forex, stock, whatever. So they already have a lot of background knowledge about how the financial market works. It is possible that they, they have already been pre-trained and then you are going to just adapt it to your particular strategy mm -hmm. that um, has this peculiar way of capturing profit. In that case, it may be possible that a deep learning network are able to, um, you know, provide value for you. Not because you need, they need your data to train this 20, 30,000 hyperparameters, but those hyperparameters are already trained. They only, they, you know, you are applying transfer learning in some sense uh, that just use your small amount of data to adapt the models more specifically to your market. That it is possible that that will succeed. And in fact, I have seen papers trying to make that work, you know, this general framework of using a deep learning network to learn from other data, uh, from other time series and, and, and specializing it in, in a particular training model, but I haven't seen it work yet. And the concept sounds attractive, but yeah. it hasn't worked. And um, so, um, uh, but it's remained a controversial topic. So for me, um, not having seen concrete evidence that a deep learning network actually provide value to finance, I, I'm sticking to our trusty um, boosted decision tree. Yeah, 
Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Oni. Um, we'll do one more, one or two more questions and we'll start wrapping up. So this one is from Jones around tool sets. Have you given up on MATLAB and now use Python exclusively? Uh, no, no. Actually, I've, uh, I've familiarized myself with uh, both R because I teach using R in uh, Northwestern for many years, uh, Northwestern University. And uh, Python, I picked up a few years ago and uh, you know, familiarized myself because many of the uh, deep learning library obviously are written in Python. Um, I, I can say that um, um, you know, despite the, um, uh, the advantage of using Python for machine learning because of the large number of libraries, if you are looking to apply traditional time series analysis uh, or traditional econometric uh, models like a factor or the regressive model and so forth, uh, one must be very careful about, uh, about the existing Python libraries. They are full of bugs. And it is not me saying that. Every, mm -hmm. It's well known in the econometric community that one should avoid Python like the plague if you are using time series analysis. Wow, okay. I, actually, I, I have a, a specific example of egregious errors that Python library can give in my second edition of my first book, which is coming out in a few months. Okay, I look forward to that one. Um, so, uh, so, so how can people, how do you recommend people get started with this then if there's all these bugs in Python and they want to, uh, you know, start applying these techniques or testing them with their own strategies? What do you recommend? Okay, so um, if you are uh, all, all by yourself on your own, like an independent trader, I recommend MATLAB because they they have all the libraries that are necessary for either traditional econometric time series analysis as well as um, random forest and uh, even deep learning. You can get everything you need from 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 MATLAB. They have mm -hmm. all the libraries necessary. Um, however, if you have a team or you 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 intend to hire people to do research for you. You, yeah, you know, right now, if you're, if you're uh, going to go out to hire uh, new grads from, you know, either bachelor or math, master degree level, um, data scientists or uh, quant finance graduates, um, few of them will know MATLAB. So you, 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 but they are very good at Python. So you, you should hire them and ask them to use Python. Just don't use use it for time series analysis, but <laughs> use it for machine learning. Um, so all R, R I have no, no one has ever complained about bugs in, 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 in the R time series package yet. You know, I haven't seen any bugs. You know? right. So, um, you know, if you don't like MATLAB, you can use R. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, but if you are only using machine learning, uh, Python is perfectly fine. Uh, you know, it has all the libraries necessary. Just refrain from using it on traditional time series econometric analysis. Yeah, okay. Joan says, uh, thank you very much for hearing your answer concerning computer language. So uh, thanks for explaining that a bit further. Um, so now how can people uh, learn more from you or yeah, get in touch with you? Um, well, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I have an email address called uh, Ernest at uh, predictnow.ai. So you can send mm. email me up there. Okay. Yeah. Can, uh, can. Oh, sorry. Can you uh, oh, info at predict out the AI? I also will be fine <laughs> from that. Yeah. Sometimes earnest is misspelled. Some people don't know if there should be an A or not. Info. Everybody know how to spell that. So info, info at predict out the AI would work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And can you briefly yeah. explain what predict now AI website is? What What is it used for? What can people do? Yeah. Well, it is a no-code website because um, uh, for building machine learning models, you upload your own returns there. We provide hundreds of variables to choose from pre-existing, so you don't actually need to build your own features if you don't want to, and we are continuing to add to that feature set. But if you want, you, you, you have proprietary features, you can upload there as well. You don't have to tell us what features they are, so you, you're not leaking any trade secret because you can call your feature F1, F2, F3. Who is to know what they are, right? So they are essentially anonymized to us. And with that data set, which is just a spreadsheet, we will make a, a predictive model to predict whether your trade will be successful or profitable 
next time or the next period. So that's the basic usage. And again, all those feature selection uh, algorithms that I mentioned, clustering, CMDA, that rank the importance of those features in clusters, that's also part of the output as well. So this is a, a no-go system. You do not need to know any computer programming language. Not Python, not R, not MATLAB. It's a spreadsheet <laughs> system that you can upload. And that's what I wanted for myself when I was starting this, because even yeah. though I've you know, been programming for decades, right? <laughs> I still find that if you have to put together a machine learning system that has no bugs, it is a very painful process. <laughs> You know, and because there's so many components. So we, I want to debug the system once and for all and have everybody use it, uh, including myself, instead of having to, you know, make sure that every time I add a new uh, module, uh, it, it has no bug. So that, that's the, the, uh, uh, the rationale behind this offer. Yep. okay. It and also has an API. If you really want to use the API, <laughs> you can. If you yeah. want to interact with the API using Python, you can but you don't have to. Yeah, okay. And just one final question. Someone's just asked about the, you got a trading course on your website, Predict Now. Uh, Jeff, can we you describe the um, benefits of it? Yeah. The trading courses are free on our website. So if you are a, you know, if you um, subscribe as a trial subscriber, which is free, you will already immediately get access to all these videos, uh, hours and hours and hours of video. They are mm -hmm. all free. It, we, we don't charge for it um, yeah. because you, you don't have to pay for it in the first month of your subscription. So you can spend your time just watching video in that first month. Um, yeah. I do offer pay courses on my other website, edchan.com. Um, that's I've been offering for, for years. That's much more uh, detailed and come with all kinds of assignment exercises, codes, and uh, it's not just a lecture. So it, it has a, a full package of software code and data to come with it. And that's on uh, my other website that I've been running for many years, epchan.com, which is separate from Predict Now. The courses on Predict Now are all free. Um, it, they don't come with software for you to try because yeah. you can immediately try it using our no-code interface already. So there's no software needed. <laughs> that's the whole point. It's a no-code system. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Ernie, was, we had a really great chat and there was a lot of good questions in the um, in the chat window as well. Um, I think we covered most of them. So uh, thank you for everyone's uh, engagement today. And um, we just got a couple of uh, thank yous in the chat. So I might just share these before we wrap up. So Jeff said, uh, terrific interview. Thank you. I agree. Um, it was a great chat today. And we've got one here from RDE. G'day, RDE. Good to see you. Thank you, Ernie. And one more from uh, from Ola. And uh, we'll finish up. So yeah, lots of... Um, Lots of great stuff you shared with us today, Ernie. So thank you very much. And for um, everyone who enjoyed today, please remember to hit uh, the thumbs up on the video and subscribe because we're going to release more uh, new content on the channel very soon. So thanks again, everybody, for attending. And thank you very much, Ernie. All the best. And I'll catch you again, hopefully soon. Maybe, you, not, maybe not leave it six years next time. <laughs> okay. Thanks, All right. everyone. Cheers. All right. Thank you very much. All Bye. the best. Bye.